Dr. Steph the Dark, welcome back to another unfiltered and uncensored conversation with young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Uh, I am happy to be back with you. The real person in charge of the hits. Uh, Tiff about to be thrown off the show. Thank you for standing in That's uh, so as, catty, as well as you could. Really uh, frat brother Eric, line brother KD, That's and Winston, so get him catty. into school. <laughs> <laughs> as well as you could. Enjoyed my time in Hawaii. Beautiful Hawaii. And uh, have uh, reemerged back in love uh, of sorts with the sector. So uh, glad to be back with you. We jump into tonight's conversation with the big news of the week, uh, Howard University. Um, and there are several big items, but this was the biggest one because I think it has the, the closest impact to what people on the campus will see and feel as a result of leadership. And that is, wow, Eric changes <laughs> screen save to hold his nose. Howard University has announced that they will phase out over the next several years of its student, faculty, and alumni trustee seats on its board of trustees. Uh, the logic behind this is that uh, is twofold. Number one, uh, officials say that it will give them an opportunity to reach a broader cross-section of folks from these different stakeholder groups uh, as they look to meet with them, uh, to have opportunities to engage, uh, and, to, and to hear concerns from these groups, and they're not going to be marginalized to just one vote on the board. The second part of this is, and this was a key element of their release on the information, we want all of our trustees to be fiduciary, <laughs> fiduciary responsible members of the school, meaning if you ain't paying, you can't sit here. So I would ask, let's go round robin, Tiff. We started, it is your alma mater. How do you feel about Howard announcing that there is, uh, at, at some point, uh, no more utility uh, for student, faculty, and alumni representation directly in the form of a vote on the board? Um, first of all, I, I get it when when I read that they want people who will be uh, people who, who have a fiduciary responsibility, but that's a little, that's a little rude because in some form or fashion, students are paying Alumni have paid the cost to have that degree. Dang, my degree is downstairs. They have that degree. They done paid something. Somebody has paid something. Somebody has signed on somebody's line to pay for that Howard degree. So that's one. Second thing is in that um, release, they talked about how they had an external um, firm conduct a review. And th the biggest problem that I have with that in particular is that people who are external, people who don't understand, people who are not of the experience, they don't know anything. And so their, their understanding and their opinion, it really doesn't matter. We all know what it feels like to have somebody try to tell you about you. And so that's what really came through for me. And to see, oh yeah, we'll figure it out as we go along, how we're going to incorporate students, faculty, and alumni, but you didn't present a plan. You know we want to see a plan. If you have presented a well thought out plan instead of just, oh, we'll get to it when we get to it, people probably would not be as upset. I'm lying. They would still be upset. But like, come on! You, that's you what I'm saying. Y'all don't want to see a plan. Y'all were gonna be mad at this no matter what. It don't matter. That's, that's about it. Now, I will say, HUSA, um, the Howard University Student Association, they put out um, a timeline of how all this happened, and I think it, that was very interesting because it was seen that what they're saying happened and what the university said happened are two different things. It could so, be two different perspectives of engagement with the actual students on what we're talking about versus yes. what they did. So, yes. Yeah, so they say from March 16, 2020, the university announced this online instruction will take place for the remainder of the spring 2020 semester. Then it says during fall 2020 and spring 2021. Houston Executive Senate and Elections Commission contacted administration regarding the, quote, pause on affiliate trustee positions. Students were met with limited and inconclusive responses. So that means that there wasn't an active conversation, investigation, like what that release said happened over time. 
I mean, in in their view, and I I don't know, I don't mean to disparage what what their experience or the conversation was, but you know, the board. I guess in my mind, and, and and brothers, I'm gonna get to you for sure. In my mind, what a board is going to do to itself, and this is a private board, what a board is gonna do to and for itself. Not to say that it is not the concern of the stakeholders they serve, but there there's nothing you can do about it. Legally, they're responsible for, for yes. signing on the dotted line to say, if, if this school goes under, I'm responsible for it. Yes. If this, yes. If, the, if if we get sued, I'm, I'm putting my name on the road to be sued along with it. So, you know, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. And I, and I think that there, there, there is something to be said about engagement with stakeholders. Katie, I'll come to you next, but at the same time, I mean, to your point, Tiffany, about people on the outside and, and external, uh, you know, consultants or whatever, there's a whole bunch of people who serve on boards who didn't graduate, who didn't take classes, who didn't That's teach. True. And, and to that point, uh, I, I get that. But also, as somebody who who obviously works in higher ed and at an HBCU and thinking about people who actually do have, quote, skin in the game who do have that financial responsibility, that that institutional responsibility, it is different. The pressure is different. So I do get the university's decision on, on that end. But as we've seen in the last two weeks, people who do have a responsibility, they can also decide to do whatever they want as well. And sometimes that is to the detriment of the institution. So if this is also a decision that was made to... have closed, have a closed or more private, um, less than transparent transactions of the board. Oh, you're there. That's on, brand for, that's on brand for a private school. I, this, this call space space. Katie, what do you think? First thought, this is Howard business. Right. <laughs> Let the Howard community deal with it the way that they deal with it, right? Any opinion outside of a Howard student or alumni or faculty doesn't really matter. But disappointed a little bit because especially removing the student voice, um, they are the ones that are affected. These are not high school students. These are not elementary school students. These are college students. They're young adults. Um, and the ones that are speaking for the university um, understand what's going on on the day to day. And they do indeed deserve a voice or a seat at that table, in my honest opinion. Um, as somebody who used to serve as a senator at Cop State University, sorry, we got to affect change on campus in real time, year to year. So I, I firmly believe that it's okay to have the students there. Um, the other stipulation of having a, a fiduciary responsibility does make sense on its face. So I won't, I won't bash that too much, right? Because again, you do want people that's invested financially. Um, but yeah. Uh, Beyond that, this is our business, man. And I, I mean, <laughs> you don't you don't think that you don't think that it's something that that HBCUs at large could take an interest in? Because I gotten a, a couple of texts, not many, but a few, um, on the subject of okay, well this this makes sense when you think about it this way. Um, and and Howard is one of those schools. I think when they do something, other people take a look at it and say maybe that could work for us too. So um, particularly I, when you. If I'm a private mm -hmm. school, I do think that some people would try this model and mm -hmm. that there's nothing that we could do about it. Because, again, we, we complain about boards on this pod a lot, all the time. All right. All right. But I think our, our biggest enemy isn't really the university president at the time. It's the board. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have any enemies. We don't have any enemies. We are just our, <laughs> enemies, our, biggest, our, biggest, uh, our, our biggest opposition are to <laughs> because that's the most stable body in our community. That's the thing that really has not changed over the past you 20 years. can't change, right. Uh, give or take, right? So in that regard, I hear you. Because, yeah, in private school, if I'm a private school and I have a seat at the table, I would be worried if my seat was in jeopardy. I would be doing things to make sure that I get to keep my seat if it means something to me. But for the public schools, not so much because they're beholden the states. Right. Stick and their them. politics. Right. Winston, you work with an organization that works with a board. Um, what do you think about that? that kind of reorganization where certain i guess perspectives or certain ideas 
are are no longer filtered through the usual you have a vote you have a voice at the table yeah no you know for you know for us the board kind of drives everything and you make to i think somebody i don't know if you said it or kd but like sometimes you're not even involved in that situation you know what i mean you kind of are just doing what happens as a result of those conversations and and those meetings and you're not privy to it so it's not really a foreign perspective you know uh mm-hmm. as, as far as i'm concerned and it's just i know that that happens sometimes I think that, you know, like we said, Howard being a private institution, is kind of its own thing and a, a different way of approaching it. I don't I, you know, the way that they worded it in the in, what, in the release that was put out and, and those things like you gave you gave the impression or, or gave room to say, like, we're not saying that the that there won't be a voice for the students who are there. They're just not going to be they don't have a seat at the table to, to say the to say the least. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting because we talk a lot also on this show about how nobody's in the uh it completely you know we're good as far as financial is concerned and as far as you know the the futures of institutions like we're all trying to make sure that things are where they should be and figure it out and you know howard is kind of i think doing what howard would be expected to do shake things up a little bit do some things different than maybe everybody else is doing finding a different way to navigate if it works it works if it doesn't then maybe there's an opportunity to reevaluate that and i do think that the student body there if there's a, a period of time that goes by where they don't feel like they're getting resolved from that or they have a problem with it or you know alumni are, are engaged to the point of they're gonna make a, a stink about it they'll they'll speak up they'll they'll do what they do so i mean i think howard is also doing what it's supposed to do in the space of figuring out what they think is going to make sense for them and doing something that's going to shake the table a little bit because the reality is it's not going to be you're not going to go status quo something's going to have to change you have to look at things and evaluate differently. So I think they're doing what you would think they would do. And by all intents and purposes, they're considered leaders in the sector and one of the leading institutions or whatever. So they're going to do things to kind of make it a little, see what happens and make it a little bit different. And I think, you know, they're, I think they're allowed the space to do so. I'm, again, like to Katie's point, I'm not a Howard alum. I'm sure my, you know, those perspectives are different, but from outside looking in, I feel like they have an opportunity to, to examine whether or not this makes sense. And that's what I think they're doing. So I think you kind of got to do that. Eric, the critical part of this conversation, and I, I'm sure Tiffany wouldn't debate this, is that it's one of those moves that at a school which is has a culture that is very, very much driven by conspiracy and quote unquote lack of transparency by the board, where people feel like the board says and does things and the campus doesn't know there's like this unseen hand that kind of moves and shapes Howard in a, in a very specific way. And, you know, to stop that, we're going to run up in the A building. Or to stop that, we're going to badmouth you online. Do you think that that feeds to that, that they're, they're, that the board is moving in secrecy as usual? This is on brand for Howard. The board don't move in secrecy. The board, <laughs> <laughs> the board does what they're going to do in your face. Right. That, that's uh, my sense, but a lot of people don't feel that but, way. But see, I think I think the and this is now you talk about conspiracy theory. I think Howard actually has two boards. <laughs> no, no, no. Hear me out. Hear me out. This is gonna sound crazy, but hear me out. Is the board you know, and then it's the actual board, which is where Howard's majority of their annual budget comes from. Mm-hmm. I, I mean. If, it, if I knew if I was an entity and I was dumping 300 something million into a school on a yearly basis, I'd probably have some input on what's going on. Uh, well, the on secretary the- of education is an ex officio member of the board and yeah, whoever yeah. is sitting in that seat serves as that. There's role. a board and then there's another board. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but you know what, bro, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. And that, and every HBCU has that. And every agency has that, right? There's a board so, that sits there at the board table, and then there's your biggest donor. There is probably your biggest industrial counterpart in the city who can make calls and say, you know what? I want to see this happen. So you're right. But to Howard's point about saying we don't need we don't need these particular elements of the board anymore, or we feel that they're not helping us to propel forward. Does that help or hurt the notion that that at Howard people feel and have long felt this institution doesn't want everybody involved in its decision making? No, it's okay. Yes, it does support that notion, right? But also, there is literally no institution, it doesn't matter what type of institution it is, who actually, like, the thought process of an alumni board member 
or a student board member is like giving it's like making Juneteenth a federal holiday. Explain it. it it's it's, a, it's throwing the it's throwing the public a bone essentially up front when honestly people really don't care that they're doing it. It just looks good in the public eye, mm-hmm. right? Kente cloth, Nancy Pelosi. Exactly what Winston said. <laughs> it's just like that, right? It's just like that, right? So, so the thought process of, oh, you're taking these positions away because, and now that it affects something. Let's be, let's ask a serious question, and it's going to be rude, but it is what it is. For your for your own alma maters, anybody listening to this show, what exactly has your student? Or and or alumni board of trustee member actually impacted that has taken place on campus, and I mean <laughs> seriously, because half the time the people who vote for them, they ain't like. I went to UDC. I was involved with SGA at UDC. The person who ended up becoming like the student board of trustee member, like, why did people vote for him? Like, ask yourself about that at any institution. It's so, not really but, right. But, but, but to your point, Eric, I hear you. You're right. But it does serve a second purpose as well. You get the information firsthand. That, so that's the other. So that I was actually going to get to that. So that's that's where the issue probably comes in at. I would be very scared if I was a Howard student or a student from any other institution because the leaks won't happen like they used to. There's less information that's going to get out there. But let me throw something at you, though. Tiffany, I see you. We're coming to you next. I don't believe, as a student, I didn't experience this, and I don't think it's going on today. I don't think the students are leaking like that anyway not for no two more. reasons. Not number no one, one, maybe not to number the body one, at large. It's, it's right. It's hard. never been that, that trustees, even before social media or even with social media, would get on Twitter instantly and say, guess what they in here doing? We don't they care wouldn't do that. They that's wouldn't do that. They that's wouldn't do that. That's all we're saying. And when you sit in that SGA meeting and mm-hmm. you're trying to do things on campus, you need to know why you can't. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and and that's what they're losing. They're yeah. going to start losing battles as students because they don't have information. They were and already that, taking L's. I mean, it's not like the students were winning now, according to them. Now, but there will be some compromise. And there, there, there is an opportunity for zero compromise to happen. It, it, it may seem like a small thing right now, but it could snowball to a point where you have a contentious relationship between the students on campus and your faculty. Now, the students at Howard I, I, were like, just in the A building a couple years ago. Tiffany, what man, are you going to say? And they were dancing <laughs> to Rihanna. Like <laughs> it's already contentious. Go ahead. Listen, but but here goes the, here goes the one thing though. And here here's the point that I would give to anybody who is within Howard. And I'm not a Howard alumni, but I don't give my opinion anyway. For all the we want people to be fiduciarily, you know, in, involved, I would ask for the donation papers of the people who have been sitting on the board at Howard or for them to actually quantify and qualify what they have done to improve the institution in their time and sitting in that position. That's because really- if you're going to now hold a standard That's of really- people being involved with the with the bettering of the institution on in a fiduciary space then from the top you need to emulate exactly what you are expecting of people in those roles it's a point tiffany what are you gonna say we close this out two things first the h book exists Your that <laughs> the handbook exists i don't know what that is i just said <laughs> I I didn't, the I didn't handbook exists If you know your rights as a student, if you know the rights of the university and its officials, which everybody has access to, then you know how to conduct yourself. But do you take the time to do it? That's a whole other thing. They didn't say anything specifically about the Houston Constitution being changed, the bylaws, the the, uh, U.S., US, UG, uh, the Undergraduate Student Assembly, or anything else being changed. Until we get to that point seriously where they start attacking um the powers of student government in that manner um i wouldn't be too concerned i will say that when you disenfranchise people you also have to know that 
since you disenfranchise them, they're going to do what they have to do. So I think how we're just to close it out. I think they. Oh, you, your second thing. Second ahead. thing. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, dang, you interrupted me. I can't remember. Can I remember? Oh, second thing. Y'all said the leaks. Y'all think the leaks won't happen? The leaks. The leaks gonna happen. The the leaks are gonna happen. Yes, Jared, and you know what I'm talking about. A few years ago, I got this email with all this. <laughs> and I swear to y'all. Jared knows what I'm talking about. I swear to you. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. I, I literally swear don't know what you're talking about. I, I swear to y'all, Jared says, has sworn he didn't do it. He did not send it. It was not him. It was not me. We know, know exactly what you're talking about. It was not me. We know who that email came from somebody and it had all the information in it. And it came directly <laughs> to me. And I said, <laughs> I don't have all the information, but what I'm saying is, I think that it, 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 to the point that we've been talking about for years, trustees being co-opted by interest, that happens more with those particular those particular seats. Alumni, students, faculty get bullied into positions all the time. They get they get bribed into positions all the time. Let's not play games like that. Those were not seats that were swinging votes on critical measures to begin with. They were there to support a close measure, which is typically something to say, here's what we're going to do about somebody with tenure or something we're going to do with somebody with, um, uh, you know, something on fee increases or something on, on building a building. If, it, if something was close, I'm going I'm to lean on that student to do what I want him to do. We're not talking about, you know, measure hiring and firing a president. You don't you don't see students, faculty and, and alumni swinging that. If they're going to do that, they're going to do that publicly as a group. They're not going to do it as one one voice on the board. But anyway, it is interesting to see how that may progress into something that shapes policy at a lot of institutions, um, because I think that Howard opens the door for a lot of schools to say, if you're not paying, you can't play. And if you are representing a stakeholder group, you may or may not have a, an interest that represents the school as a whole. As I wrote the other night, faculty can't vote against their, they shouldn't vote against their interests. You do something to build a new student center and a whole bunch of adjuncts get laid off. What faculty vote for that? Right. Or a student is up there. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to marginalize student services so you can hire more faculty or create more endowed positions. What student is going to vote for that? And then go back and tell the students say, yeah, I just screwed this over. That's not, that's not going to happen. So oh, no, it, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to tell you what actually happens. And we actually may have talked about it before. The board says, you got student loans, right? Well, I'll get rid of all those if you go ahead with this vote. And they are doing that. So let's they not sit here and act that. like, what's student going for that? Listen, some, there were, there's a many people who will sit here and be like, I got to get mine like y'all got to get yours. And they're mm -hmm. going to take care of mine. So yeah, I'm going to do what I got to do this for them to take care of mine. Get in mind segs us perfectly into the next topic. Mackenzie Scott, uh, yesterday, another round of giving $2.7 billion uh, to 200 plus organizations. Uh, this go around, none of them were historically black institutions. Now, let me take a moment to, to get some off my chest real quick. So I post this on Facebook, right? And I got like 15 or 16 comments and I read them because um, I care about what folks say. And my impression is that uh, until you prove me otherwise, that you're pretty smart. But the overwhelming reaction to this post was, why are you putting this out? This isn't news. This is negative. Why don't you just be thankful for what she gave before? Uh, why is this? Why? Why is this even a story? Must be a slow news day. And I'm sitting up here thinking. <laughs> so it's not newsworthy that a lady who of the six billion dollars that she's given, 10 percent of that has gone to HBCUs in this case of six hundred million dollars. She's given in theory to all HBCUs, but specifically to 23 institutions, but all of them by way of UNCF and TMCF gifts. And it's not news that in the third time she's done it, when the previous two she has, the third time she doesn't, that's not news. Maybe I'm asking you guys, am I tripping? Is that newsworthy to mention that somebody who's given hundreds of millions of dollars to HBCUs didn't this time around? It didn't say that she wouldn't do it again. It didn't offer an opinion on, is this the end of Mackenzie Scott's love affair with HBCUs? It was just to say, 
She didn't give anybody anything this time. So if anybody read the blog post that she put out and in the article that was in, uh, not the New York Times, CBS News, something like that, something about how they have, she has a whole board of people to like, you know, do her research, do these things. And did every HBCU get an individual donation? No. If they didn't, to me, that would mean it's, <laughs> it might be newsworthy. It might be worthy <laughs> of mentioning because that means maybe your institution, if it's your beloved institution, has an opportunity to do something to land on the radar of right. Mackenzie Scott. Right. So that, if no other reason than that, it would be newsworthy. It's I was just surprised everybody. that people were almost like saying, shut up. Like, don't talk about this. Be grateful for all that she's given. And that therein lies a problem. <laughs> Eric, you look at quizzical. What what what's your reaction to one? The school's not getting any money this time around, and two, people saying, "Hush up," because she gave some money to us before. If your school ain't get money paid by Mackenzie Scott yet, you need to go complain to people that's leading your school. <laughs> so should we talk about schools that have not? No, because because listen, because this is not even a brand conversation no more, right? And that's see, and here goes a problem. Too often, when it comes to our HBCUs, we rank them, Jinx, based upon what our idea of them is based on their branding, right? But there's a lot of schools that have great brands that like to strike from the top that ain't getting nothing in their pockets. But we will sit here and talk about <laughs> okay, that's what, that's how who, they, okay. who their competitors are, why they up there, they're moving to the swag. <laughs> they football team, they ban all this other stuff. Who complaining? What you mad for? I just got back in y'all spicy. No, nah, look, look, they could come at me. I don't care. You ain't doing it. Nah, I did it. I felt it. I'll be the one. But it's not just them. It's a whole bunch of HBCUs. It, there's a hundred and what, hundred and four that are still open in hundred one. Say, say hundred now. Hundred now. Hundred accredited. <laughs> Listen, uh, look, a quarter of them got money which means right but, cool. but okay oh, tiffany go ahead there is a lesson in it because one she can spend her money however she want to spend her money we see mm -hmm. that she paid a cost to be the boss that's all her that's one wait how about don't go too far two two she didn't give money to HBCUs this go around. That should teach us all. Right. Detroit came up on this. This this third go around, we came up with it. We did. This go around should teach us as HBCU alum, advocates, influencers, supporters that you still must give. We still have the needs. You can't count on somebody that's rich, rich and white. To do what we need to do for ourselves. I don't think everybody, anybody was ever counting on her because it's so arbitrary how she does it. No, in my mind. but in the sense that if you thought that she would give again, if we're saying that, hey, she didn't give, what I thought when I was reading that was, hmm, this is all the more reason why we need to increase our own giving, increase our own time that we give or in kind things that we do to grow our institutions. Not that, damn, she ain't give again. No, because it doesn't matter whether well, it does matter that she gives, but it shouldn't be news to the point where, or if she doesn't give, news to the point where it's like disappointing. No, you so need to have you first. You think I shouldn't have covered it because people are no, saying, no, why would you no, even no. write this up? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I like that you did because what I'm saying that enables me to say what I'm saying now. So I need to take from that that hey, you still need to give. We're not getting another however many millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars just out the sky. We're not getting that. We didn't get it this time around. We still need your $30, sis. Is it going to be PayPal or check or cash app? You know, what's it going to be? Do, 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 do you think it sends a bad signal, Katie? Do you think that it's like, uh-oh, you know, she gave the first two times and gave handsomely um, and actually increased from time number one to time number two? It was only about, what, six or seven schools the first time? And then she went to about 14 or 15 the second time? So in, a, in total, I think it's 27 individual institutions that she's given to and Thurgood Marshall and UNCF. So she's given to all of them. In theory, she's given to all of them. 
But in terms of individual gifts, there are still, as Eric mentioned, Florida A&M University hasn't gotten one. South Carolina State, Southern, Texas Southern. There's a whole bunch of state. <laughs> there's a whole bunch of state schools um, that haven't received it. So, is it a bad sim- signal um, if if you haven't gotten yet it yet? Um, but it didn't come through on this third round and no HBCU did. Do you think that the well is dry or this is just a particular focus area this time around? So um, is it a bad signal? Not really. Because it's philanthropy. Philanthropy is unpredictable. People care about what they care about it when they care about it. And we just have to accept that for what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say this. If you're telling me that she has a research team, clearly she can't be an expert on the entire higher education field um, overnight especially um, with the large amount of gifts that she's given. Clearly, she's just not going to spend this money on her own. Nobody in their right mind would take billions of dollars and just start tossing it everywhere just because they can, right? At least not, you know, in good faith. Um, So she's trusting her team, and her team is giving her information. And so let's treat her money like she's investing in the schools. And so she's giving it a year or two to see what type of return on investment that she gets. Let me see what you did with the money. Um, and let me see how many students we graduate. Let me see what type of employees we create. Let me see what type of citizens come out of this. And then, you know, if I like what I see on the back end, I'll give again. And then let's not underscore the political part of this as well. Um, Joe Biden used language. And so maybe she's following the language that Joe Biden's using. Mm-hmm. Right? Maybe these round of schools went to MSIs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, hey, they have a large amount of black people there. So this school needs some money, too. It was a whole bunch of Cal California schools and Texas schools in that this time. HSIs. Correct. So, so, so I wonder I wonder if 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 folks were saying or maybe not folks close to her, but at least po- folks in her orbit were saying that's enough of the black folks <laughs> this time around. Now, it's not to say that because there are other organizations that you get to that support you know, black causes and black people. Um, but I wonder if the the outward Winston was to say, okay, let's be a little more diverse in what we're doing. I hate that word. I, I, I get you. I get you. But as you said, as you said, Detroit, Detroit came up this time. Detroit got a lot of a lot of black different people. organizations. Right. Detroit has no HBCUs, but a lot of black people. So you yeah. can't it's it's difficult to make the proposition like, okay, well, do, what what's going on here? Before you go to Winston Woman, one more point. Mm-hmm. To the idea if, if it's bad, let's just say that it is bad. It's because mm-hmm. we have a branding issue. The other 78 schools, you have a branding right. issue. You need to fix your brands. It may not be their brand. Listen, or, programming, or a programming issue. Right, it's not programming. Let me explain. Let me, let me, I'm, this is going to be rude, but this goes back to the school I was mentioning earlier. You can't trust your own alma mater to actually handle their regular budget. You expect <laughs> somebody to, to allow them. To dictate how they spending millions is dropped in their lap. Oh god! Uh, <laughs> some of y'all schools gonna mess around and see the whole board pull up in furs at homecoming, and y'all still got the same you the, the same resources. Don't don't say that. I, th- listen, we talk about us. We we <laughs> listen. We can't tell the truth about us. We can't tell the truth. I'm not saying that we all like that, but listen, like. It ain't necessarily branded. It ain't programming. It's about the fact that some of y'all can't handle. If she had given money to to that school that we ain't gonna mention down, that's trying to get back into the group of a group of schools that they ain't and they ain't been open for real for real for the last umpteen years. If she had given money to them, we'd look at her like Are you out of your mind. I'm looking at everybody else that gives them money like that. But hey, I, I understand it. I, I understand it. It's a it's a branding thing within itself, how you give and to whom you give. But I would also say there are some good schools that may not be on her radar just because her people may not be that familiar. For example, Tiff got on the shirt. Paul Quinn. Paul Quinn is coming up. Now, You there might be a metric where they say, OK, well, how many students do you have? Paul Quinn has stable leadership. Paul Quinn has been fundraising. Paul Quinn has been in local and national news for years. But Paul Quinn doesn't yet have a thousand students. Fisk University, Fisk is coming up, but they've not had leadership stability. They just had a changeover. They just got a new president. Fisk has a a a, a, a time tested brand, but as long as old as that brand is, it's also connected with financial instability. So you can never tell what the 
what the formula is for her and her team. But you can, I guess you can kind of draw some conclusions, I guess. And you wonder like how much of it is tied to how, you know, how, what does your trajectory look like? What does your trajectory look like? So I, I, I have no clue. I wish I had insight, but it is interesting to see that some schools with big brand, big historic brand haven't gotten it yet. And schools that have been victimized by states like a South Carolina state, like a Southern university, they struggle not just because of internal incompetence that's a part of it, but they struggle mightily because of what the state is doing to them on purpose. So now Tennessee state, state. North Carolina school got in a uh, and T they got it in the first time around. Winston Salem state. Winston Salem state got it, but central didn't get it. Central has been stable. Central has been growing. So you, you don't, you really don't know the rhyme or reason. Tiff, go ahead. Um, I was just going to push back a little bit on what you were saying about Paul Quinn. Like, I mean, if if their enrollment is under not if their enrollment being under a thousand isn't necessarily bad if they're still in the black with it like i think right. i told you the other day when i was watching uh the president of shorter talk about shorter to be in the black not in debt they need 300 or so students they have 600 right so like i think that depends and i think that's a, a conversation to have when we talk about what we need as individual institutions and as and as a collective, that's something that we have to explain to potential supporters who are outside of of the experience and outside of the community. We operate differently. But I think that that's a tough that's a tough conversation because I don't think anybody would walk out even to their stakeholders and say we're in good financial position because we have double the amount of students it takes to run the institution. So, because at the end of the day, anybody would look at a school with 300 to 600 students and say, that school looks like it's struggling. Looks like, and they could not be struggling. Paul Quinn is not struggling at all. Paul not Quinn at is, all. Gro- is yes, growing. Two days ago was an indication. They're not struggling. But, but from outer, outer perspectives, when you, I guess when you think about traditional higher education, there are people who would say, you know, okay, good for them, but I, my but, high my high school is bigger than y'all. The majority of traditional higher education is they white. don't they don't know they don't they don't know any better they don't know any better and so how do you educate them, Winston? And I this and I think this is this is this is particularly to 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 a, 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 a program like Midnight Golf where you could say, hey, we work with students from some really under resourced uh, communities. And some students that are going to underperforming high schools, but they're great. Take a look at them. Take a look at their scores. Take a look at their GPA. Take a look at their activities. Take a look at their extracurriculars. But how difficult is it to make that case? I think this is what we're talking about with Mackenzie Sky. And we're asking who gets money, who doesn't. How do we, how do you explain the formula? How do you work against the algorithm? How do you showcase good when the algorithm reads it and says bad? Yeah, no, I think you have to look at, you know, like you said, it's, it's it's difficult to answer the question to 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 go against that. But what we talk a lot about with parents and, and and supporters of young people when we're in this space is look at what that school has done with students like yours. So let you know, let's maybe you got a student who's a high got a nice GPA, low test score. But Paul Quinn's like, hey, we'll take a chance on that young person. We'll give him an opportunity because that's what we're, that's what we're about. That's the mission of our institution. You know, you look at like a Claflin who, you know, Claflin's not Howard, but Claflin is a great private school, you know, that most people from Detroit or Chicago or wherever, they don't know, they're not familiar with it, but you talk to them about, look what opportunities your young person could have at a smaller institution like that. Look at what they've done with what they get, like what, what comes out of those institutions, you know, based on what they get from or their, 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 the pool that they're, they're pulling from. So just to make sure that you look at it in full context and full scope. So to your point, like, you know, we don't know the level of understanding that McKinsey's group that she's put together has of the sector of, you know, students of color, particularly of our institutions in this space, which is, again, why it was a relevant thing for you to to bring up. Because to me, I think it speaks to, you know, making sure that everybody, because I think I would even argue that those of us who are who are knowledgeable in the sector to a certain extent still don't understand, you know, how the, the different layers of even our institutions. And then you know that, you know, the difference between, you know, a Grambling or a Winston-Salem or like I said, a Claflin and a Howard and and how, you know, finding a young person, particularly for us, who could fit 
who fits in that in that in that bill. But you have to understand the the playing field to be able to say what makes sense and why. You know, so you could look at the graduation rates at Philander Smith and say that's not a good school. Like you know, they're they're graduating twenty seven percent. But wait a minute, they let they're letting in kids with you know, 1.7 and a 1.8 coming out of high school, put them in a summer bridge program, giving them additional supports, putting things in place that they know those kids need to be successful. And you might have half of them that end up being on Dean's list. And, but in that half of them, you might lose two or three who just weren't able to make, but again, because those institutions are, have different missions and understandings, it's making sure that they're educated on the sector and making sure that they know what it is and that there's value in those in those institutions, <laughs> my man got the kings for never. If you're a grill, <laughs> he's tired of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I'm hungry than us. Um, <laughs> understanding the value in those things, and like I said, I think that it it may, it's probably going to be tasked with people like us to to try to talk about those things, so that those who are not as educated on it can say, oh, "Okay, here's a different way to look at it. I didn't think about it that way." Or yeah, there is there's all these layers to the sector and the institutions to be able to see that there's value no matter where you sit in there. Let's move to another uh, another topic real quick. And I'm going to throw a curveball because we were supposed to talk about how American Airlines is is changing some of its flights up to accommodate an HBCU Classic Jackson State versus Florida and m this fall. But some news breaks today about Google uh, giving uh, tens of millions of dollars to several HBCUs. And I just want to get a quick round of horn on this. Fair or foul, given the 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 coverage that we've done on this show, and that a lot of folks have talked about in terms of Google mistreating black black women, black students, HBCU students. Is this is this a, is this an opportunity to grow the institution, which the institutions are happy to take, or is this hush money? KD, your 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 computer science go. <laughs> Man, you know, uh, um, wow. So Google. We get what you're doing here. You're playing a political game like making Juneteenth a federal holiday. <laughs> That's not what we asked for. <laughs> you take your money because we need it, right? You know we need it. You know mm-hmm. we need it. But yeah, we'll take it. But we mm-hmm. ask you for pipeline to employment. We ask you to support our babies when they get there, mm-hmm. right? And then we ask just for a fair shot to climb the ladder once we get into your institution. That's what we asked for. That is what that young woman was asking for, to not be harassed because she's black in tech. This money that you're giving the HBCUs does not fix that issue. But yes, we'll take it because we need it, and you know we need it, and it's good coverage. Congratulations. You got your, you got your coverage. That's the headline. Right. And you, and you know, not you that they gave it, you know that we need it. We can't turn it down. Right, but you know. You still have a problem with how you treat. We don't even know how many of those employees that are black um, came from HBCUs. We still don't know that, right? right. So, but of the black people that you have there, we still know that you mistreat them, and you haven't fixed that. Mm-hmm. That's why people are still leaving and going to other places. Tiffany, you and I both still have Gmail accounts. Do you feel like a hypocrite as I do? <laughs> We're still using Google products. <laughs> um, nah, I don't feel like a hypocrite. Um, <laughs> Primarily because you're black in America, you run a black institution, black church, black anything. We all got strange bedfellow. So, like, mm. is this I'm sorry for 2004? You know, like, <laughs> I see it. Did, did, is this, is so, is, is this I'm sorry for 2004? You know, is this the result of, Let's say, for lack of a better phrase, settlement. Um, what? Okay, but if if you violate again, which you know is is sometimes the the uh, what's on the menu. Well, most of the time for us being black, um, what you giving more money? Is is, is this is this absolution? This not absolution. Probably. Like, you think Google ain't got enough? That's number one. Number two, why we, would we, you spend we, it that way? We're so happy to take it. We can't turn it down. <laughs> we're so happy to take. No, we can't turn it down. But I, I, and no, we can't even or, make it. Or 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 we do turn it down, and we we just we ain't got it. Yeah, we're we, ungrateful. We used to everybody to stop donating. If we say no, everybody stops donating. Yep, that's true too. 
Eric, you good enough steaks. Do you have anything to offer? <laughs> Do you have anything to offer? <laughs> or are you just are you is this podcast sponsored by Kings for Charcoal? So listen, <clears throat> and this is gonna make it real simple and plain. Tiffany is, is 100 percent correct. We not turn it down on money. But because Tiffany's correct, this is why organizations do exactly what they do. It's easier to ask for forgiveness with a blank check than it is to do right by people up front. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be worse. I mean, they could have just said, you know what? Let's make a uh, let's let's make a new um, a new picture for a whole for the whole month. Uh, to commemorate what we did wrong about these people on on the Google website, right? I mean, that's about the same thing that the federal government just did while making Juneteenth the federal holiday. So, you know, representation. Like, hey, we see you. (laughs) Enjoy that. Like, that's that's pretty much what happened. Hey, we we see that we did you did you wrong. Here's enough money. Will you now shut up about it? That's essentially what they what they're doing. The sad part about this is I believe that Google executives and higher ups want to do the right thing, but two things are problematic. One, they don't know how they don't have relationships with HBCU. So you can't find one quality student from another and, and, and to be able to distinguish, okay, how do we deploy talent and resources to these different campuses to get the best out of these students? We know how to do it at Stanford. We know how to do it at Harvard and MIT and, and all those places. We don't know how to do it with you guys. And the number two is not the higher up execs, though. No, but that, that's what I was going to say. Th- that's the other problem. The executives probably want to do right, if for nothing else, in public relations. But it's the mid managers. It's the mid managers that say, I can't work with these Negroes. They don't know anything. They don't know how to code. They can't do this. They can't do that. Why you keep sending me these people? It's the go, whole, it's the go whole, take go it's take some time off. I know you're experiencing racism. That's a mental health issue. It's like over, it, you know, the overseers. Look, Ooh. look, I cannot excuse folks, institutions that have the monies because you have money to get it right. You have money to properly train your people so that they know better, so that you don't have problems like this. You have the monies. Okay, so to that point. That is a good point. Go ahead, KD, because I follow up you. Tiffany's point, you could have kept all of this money that you just packaged and gave away to an HBCU and created a sector right. in your in your company that is all people of color that could have fixed this problem for you. And that would have been discrimination. It would have been much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Six-figure employees. You are already doing it. You're not going to do it again. Look. And give them a team. Then to just cash out HBCUs once. Right. Look, first off, you're right. We can't afford to not take the money. That's the thing. But what we can say is, Google, shame on you. Shame during during Pride Month, because the sister April Cur- Curly, shout out to the LGBTQ community. She is of right. that community. Y'all right. gonna do this during Pride Month in her <laughs> face. Shame <laughs> on y'all. Y'all gonna hit it with the Jaffe Jumper? How, how much do you need to to take it off of your plate? How much? What do you want? Y- y'all are dirty. Shame on y'all. Shame on y'all for hitting it with the Jaffe 